Hi, we're back for another episode of Make It Count with Jennifer and Phil. And today we have uh, Julie Stokes, Keith Jefferson Warrior class of week seven. Eight. Eight? I'm younger than that. Oh, 88? 88. Yeah. To graduate. Once a warrior, always a warrior. Yes, indeed. So indeed. Julie, um, in addition to having the privilege of going to East Jefferson High School with me, Hey, East awesome. Jeff isn't giving us any, like, um, we don't have to throw it out all the time. Okay. What about, why wouldn't you throw out East Jefferson all the time? You know, you're just not going to throw out any high school. It's, you not? know you're from that New Orleans when you want to throw out your high school. What high school? Well, wait, wait, what's the name of your school? Except that she went to West Jefferson. I did not go to West <laughs> Jefferson, guys. Right. I had to go to a, a Catholic school, you know, right. with the drug you know. It's a whole nother yeah. episode. Anyway. anyway. <laughs> Uh, but Julie uh, is an entrepreneur, let's say a state representative, then running for state treasurer, and then diagnosed with cancer. And now you're doing like all this amazing work for cancer advocacy. It's it's been a heck of a ride. Yeah. 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 So like, I mean, that's your story. I guess this. That's it. I guess this episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Y'all want to go back no, to church? No, but I want to go because I really, I think you're just this dynamo, and you're just doing all this amazing work, and been through some hard seasons. And what we talk about on this episode, on this podcast, is how you take the hard seasons in life and make them count. I think that's one of the most important things we can do in this world. You know, yeah. that's where the real growth is. And I think the people that never have anything go wrong, well, you better learn from those times on the mountain. Yeah. I don't think they're doing enough. If you don't have things go wrong, you probably ain't doing enough. So. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's what a friend of mine told me. I said, well, you know, it's all this stuff, and this is going wrong, and that's going wrong. And she said, Julie, because that's because you're always putting yourself out there. Yeah. If you don't put yourself out there, you never fail. Yeah. So I think to be successful, you have to be free to fail. Yeah. And on occasion, you're going to have to just you know take your chops and fail. Yeah. It's right. not fun, but it can change your life for the better, too. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So tell us a little bit about that, like, you know. Yeah, um, well, I was, you know, in the legislature, I had been there for, I was in the middle of my second term, and it had really been quite the ride. You know, I, when I when I decided to run for office, it wasn't like, I never thought in a million years I would end up running for office. But I did, and I won, and I got to serve in the legislature, and you know, you get in there for the first time, and your name's on the board, and it's just, it's really special. And at the time, we were going through tax reform under Bobby Jindal. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we got in there, and he's trying to get rid of the income tax, which is going to be happening again in a few months, but he's trying to get rid of the income tax and just do sales tax, and I'm a CPA, so I get put right in the middle of that. And my very first um, committee meeting was really being in the front row of Ways and Means Committee with them unveiling the plan. I mean, it was so interesting, and it really catapulted me into that being a, a really big part of what my service in the legislature was like. And um, the other committee that I, I didn't I didn't even want to be on health and welfare. They put me on health and welfare, and I just wanted to be on education. So I served on health and welfare, which ended up, I didn't want it but it ended up being a big part of my story. Um, so pretty much those two committees through the years, and um, I got really instrumental in helping people decode what was going on in Louisiana's budget in like fiscal problems, because it was kind of a big deal. I mean, yeah. we were just yeah, we were a mess. broke, and I, for me, it was really difficult to watch while you know, one political side would spin the story this way and the other side would spin the story that way. It was like, oh my gosh. Like as a CPA, I'm like, can we just like talk the numbers? Yeah. It's black and white. Oh yeah. my gosh. It's black and white. It's just numbers. And so, you know, I toured the state a few times talking about that. And, you know, when I was running for treasurer and everything, my, my whole thing in running for treasurer was that I felt like we needed one objective truth. And that we needed somebody at the state level, at the statewide level, that would just be this unbiased documenter of truth. And um, I felt so passionate about it. It was going very well. It was probably one of the most exciting times of my life. And 
during that legislative session in like April, um, I was, we lived like in these apartments next to the Capitol, you know, in there taking a shower and I feel something weird. And I'm like, uh oh, what's that? And I mean, but my mind starts going again with like, what do I have to do tomorrow? What's going on? You know? And it was like, well, I'm not going to be paranoid because clearly this is going to be nothing. I mean, I'm always vigilant about my health, and nothing is ever anything. I've had MRIs and this and that. Nothing's ever anything. So I don't have any family history of breast cancer. That's just stupid. That's not going to be the reality. This isn't going to happen to me. No. Yeah. And so I went on, you know, running for statewide office, needing to be in the legislature. When you're running statewide, it's not really an opportune moment to miss a ton of votes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I had a whole bunch of legislation, and I always did. Like, I, I love passing bills for just fun. Mm -hmm. So I didn't go in. And so I don't know, the, the legislative session usually ends in early June or so. And I remember it was probably the last day of session because we were sitting in my apartment and I had my campaign staff there and I was going through all my to-do folder, like getting it to people to take care of so that I could just run straight in to doing this. And I ran across my doctor's card and I gave it to my campaign manager at the time and I said, make me an appointment. I felt a lump. And everybody in the room was like, ah! I mean, it was just like this, this jaw drop moment, mm -hmm. you know? And I was like, it's not gonna be anything. I'm not worried about it. I mean, calm down. So she- <laughs> Just a lump. I mean, it's probably a cyst, some stupid little thing. It's or dense like, tissue, because yeah. that is like a thing. I oh my God. I have it, yeah. Yeah, we can talk about it. That's yeah. a whole, yeah. That's whole another thing. part of being a woman, Phil. Yeah, it you is You wouldn't understand. Hard. It is hard. Thank it you. really is. We don't have pockets. We, we don't, don't have pockets. pockets. We don't. Dense tissue. <laughs> we got to. Dense booby tissue. <laughs> no, no, call that no, muscles. Yeah. That's not no, what it's No, it's not. It's not. It's, about it's an inadequate amount of fat between the, the little, um, uh, what do you call them? The uh, ducks. The ducks. Yeah. No, yeah. You no, know, this really sucks about being a woman. Y'all got more body fat than that. <laughs> it really You does. do. It's it ridiculous. I know. I know. Ladies. I know. The you whole got stuff. your ass and your boobs and all the things. <laughs> you can be little and have more body fat than me just because I'm a dude. Exactly. It's just awesome. But yet we're held to the same standard. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Wait, no. There's a whole nother there's a whole nother podcast. Yeah. I know we wouldn't want to get lost in that. But yeah, we could probably. We could. <laughs> we just I want to do a podcast episode with me and a bunch of women talking about how much it sucks to be a woman. I want to come back to it. I was like, gonna say I don't want to be there. I am done. Right? shaking his head like, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I've got a routine for that. You just yeah. ask my husband, just like I pockets, loose yeah. clothes, socks. I'm like, yeah. Dense tissue. Yeah, yeah, that's hers. <laughs> but yeah, it's a problem. I'm sorry. We're talking okay. about your cancer jersey. Right. I just made a big joke. Uh, uh, that's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm used to that, yeah. right? <laughs> you have to have thick skin. Yeah. But not necessarily dense tissue. Yeah. <laughs> Different thing. Different right, thing. Right. Okay. So anyway, yeah, I give the card to my campaign manager. She makes the appointment. She has trouble getting the appointment scheduled. And finally, she's like, go over there today. And when I went over there today, that I, my doctor wasn't even around, and she's a friend, <laughs> but yeah. she wasn't even there. And her PA or whatever was like, oh, yeah, you probably need to go get a scan. And just, I mean, to cut it short, she, oh, actually, on my way to get the um, mammogram, so the, yeah, it was the first mammogram, I got rear-ended. So oh I'm like, gosh. oh, Jefferson Highway, about to turn into Osher, and I get rear-ended, and I'm like, this is not a good start. Right. <laughs> And I'm like, I don't have time to fool with this accident. I have to I go. Gotta go. Yeah. And, and so I was an hour late. But um, yeah. But so then every scan, every, you know, when, when you go through this, you have a screening mammogram, which I had had in September, and it showed nothing. Mm -hmm. Dead's breast tissue. Yeah. Yeah. That's a thing. Um, but again, it showed nothing. That was another reason that I felt like, who cares? This will be fine. Um, but every after your scanning mammogram, you go into diagnostic tests. Right. And that was actually a bill that I did subsequently to get those covered at the same rate and in the same way that your screening mammogram is covered, like at 100 percent. But anyway, every scan just kept coming back worse and worse. It was like in every time I would be like, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun to where like weeks into it. After it was not going well, it was like every time I went, it was like, yes, that's it. She looks kind of bad. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it'll be fine. 
it'll be fine. I mean, my, my motto, I had this, it was a, a picture of, it was like a little a dog sitting at a desk with a coffee mug. And its coffee mug says, it will be fine. <laughs> and there's a fire everywhere in the room. <laughs> like, That's your motto. That's my life. And I mean, I was still traveling statewide doing fundraisers and going to parades and all this stuff. And and boom, it came to me when uh, my, my friend, Dr. Corsetti, who was my eventual surgeon, um, the cancer surgeon, uh, when I saw his name come across my phone, it was like, oh, God. I mean, our kids had gone to school together, and so I knew him well, and I knew what he did. <laughs> we hadn't talked about the situation at all. Yeah. So when I saw him name, I said his name, I said, and that's when he told me it was triple negative, and that's, that's a tough diagnosis. I mean, that's not the only tough diagnosis in breast cancer, but it's not one of the best. Yeah. And like, you know, a lot of people don't make it through that. There were three of us that I know of that got that diagnosis in the same week. And one of us didn't hear, you know. So uh, it was time to be serious and, and deal with it. And it was the hardest thing I ever did. I think it was harder to drop out of that race than it was to know that I had the cancer. It was like, well, I can't control the cancer, but maybe I could still run. I mean, like, I, I had it, you know. And uh, eventually I had to just say, well, you know, God's got another plan. And uh, it's not the plan that I want, but I'm going to have to acquiesce to it and reframe my existence. Yeah. <laughs> it was a sharp turn. So I think it was like July that was like on July 2nd. We had the most, pretty quick. the most dismal July 4th. I mean, all sitting on the sofa, like, it was just pathetic. The four of us, mm -hmm. my family, just sitting on the sofa, binge watching stuff like, okay, everything sucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then July 6th, we were leaving to go to Utah for this Women in Government conference that I was part of. It was the concluding thing. So I put out the press release on July 6th and my phone blew up and we had uh, the news channel eight came over to interview and talk about what had happened. And, and it was just after that, we went out of town, but it was just one after another, after another, after another of like media coverage and talking about what was going on because I decided that I wanted it to be, I needed people to know. I mean, my whole life had been about this race. So if I wasn't going to do this anymore, it needed to make sense. Yeah. I'm just, I don't, I don't, you don't buy like just I, anything. I don't. And I don't, that's right. And I don't do, like, there's not two of me. Mm -hmm. You know, one that's the public persona and then one that's the girl sitting here talking to you guys. It's like, I've only got one. Yeah. And I can't fake it. So we didn't, and, you know, I had that same campaign manager um, put out bi-weekly emails to, to talk about the cancer and what was going on and we really stayed plugged in through the whole thing and it was quite the journey um some marks better than others <laughs> um and did you, did, did you do chemo i did five months and so three of the months were uh, taxol which wasn't all that bad i mean it, it's different for everybody that yeah. one was like and I couldn't run for treasurer. <laughs> and then came the quote unquote red devil. And when they call it that, that's never good. <laughs> it was pretty bad. I mean, it really tested, um, it tested your mental fortitude more than anything I found. Yeah. It was a really, it was really tough. But um, through all of that, I was blessed really to have a, people that reached out to me through cyberspace, you know, and said, I was triple negative too, and if you need to talk, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to talk. And those people, you know, I, I kept talking to on text messages and everything, when in questions or I was just freaking out. You know, so um, I was really very blessed with community support and with all of that. So that was like the big piece that came from it, was feel, realizing how much support there was out in the community and also realizing how many people are out there trying to help cancer patients. I yeah. just literally just now got a text from a guy who a friend of mine introduced me to, I've never met him actually, but introduced me to him because he's got colon cancer. And like literally he just texted me. You know, he'll text me every couple of weeks, you know, hey, this is a doctor's appointment, hey, this 
It's kind of like that's powerful. It, it is. is. Yeah. It's kind of like when you get a red car. This is like a simple example. Well, like when you get a red car, and then you start noticing all the red cars. Like you don't realize. Like when I lost Grayson, I didn't realize how common it was for people to lose babies in the second, third stillbirth. Like it is very common, and people just don't talk about it. You know. So like to have people reach out to you as a as a woman, Phil. I want to ask Julie about that because man i just sitting here i'm super inspired by you and i kind of want to be you a little bit but um not so much in the legislature because i don't like all that but um you making that decision and i'm going back a little bit of like because you were this state representative that's who you were and you you loved it that was your passion and then you had to make this decision based on something that you a diagnosis that you couldn't control like just thinking about it has got me so emotional. Like walk me through that process a little bit about like, yeah, I know you said you couldn't be the two people, but like, gosh. Yeah. So one of the things that, that happens, I mean, it happened to me and I think it happens to a lot of people when you're an elected person and you get to go to all the cool events and you know, you're, you can get identified with that. You know, yeah. it's such a part of my identity um, you know, and there were two phases of kind of that kind of eroding. Number one, when I had to pull out of that race. And then, um, long story short, a year later, my hair is an inch long and Secretary of State comes open. And people are like, you should run, you already have the campaign and all of this. I run. A whole lot of reasons why that didn't work out. But that was another loss of that. It's like, oh my gosh, you might. One inch I do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I've been sporting a good deal. This is why I'm not an elected. Yeah. It's my hair. It is my hair. My hair. My hair. <laughs> and they pump you with tons of steroids. So yeah. I was like, yeah, yeah it wasn't good. But I wasn't ready. Yeah, you know, I just talked to a friend of mine that I, I we went to London for the Saints game. Yeah. Very cool. Awesome. We got to be part of all this. Um, no, it wasn't awesome. Well, that part was for. I didn't, I didn't watch it. I mean, it was a better game in a lot of ways than I yeah. thought it would be. Yeah. But the end was like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, so that, but. Um, I'm sorry. I do this what a lot. You do. You I know, just, like, you throw it right off the rails. I know, you <laughs> threw me off the rails. Where was I even talking about? How are you? Uh, one inch. How are you? You lost your head. You lost the Yeah, and now it's in a yeah. That was kind of another big loss of it. It was like, okay. I mean, that defeat is very difficult. Mm -hmm. And to have to put your foot, one foot in front of the other, after something like that, after everything else, was like, I, there's, I, I, there's, I think a lot of people, there's a version of me from like my, you know, being a younger me that would have been like, oh my gosh, I can't keep going from this. This is just too big. First that, then this. I mean, it was very difficult. And Political just, defeat on the state level, that's pretty public. It was yeah. terrible, and especially yeah. when you're as raw yeah. as I was. With, yeah. And I remember I went to, to talk to a group um, at Fleming Steakhouse. I'll never forget those guys, but um, they were so sweet. I talked to them like the next day or the day after that, and... Um, they were amazing because I told them, I said, I'm, I'm completely raw. I don't even know how I'm here. And it's been a very difficult journey. But I'm just going to keep putting one foot in front of the other and know that as bad as it gets one day, the next day can bring something beautiful. And I think that that's something for every depressed person out there. Yeah. And I'm honest, not a chemical depression which can be a lot harder to deal with. It was like a moment in time where I just felt so defeated. It's like, it's gonna be okay. It's temporary. And so you just keep putting one foot in front of the other. But the fact other. that you could be raw and real with these ladies as a woman, I think that's what we should title this one. Bill's not a woman. No, Bill's not kidding. a woman. <laughs> um, Bill's like, hopefully I we don't have to so like, that. So much, so much comparison with women that like seeing you as a public figure then coming out of that and being so vulnerable yeah. and raw, I think people could relate to that a lot. And they felt more empathy with you than anything. That happened to me too. Like people were like, oh, so you are human and you do cry. Well, yes, I do. <laughs> you know, like, I just think that it, it takes courage 
for us to just kind of like unravel and, and maybe for you too. Because you cry all the time on podcasts. No, I cry. <laughs> First podcast feels like, Here, here's an issue. But, <laughs> but it ta- I think that that's what this podcast too is all about. That like we're all, we all bleed red. Like we're all the same. We all have these feelings in some capacity or the other. So how can we all help each other to get through it, right? That's exactly right. And I mean, so, you know, if you gloss back over and you come out and you're like, I'm perfect again. That has no value. I mean, it might have value to you keeping your dignity. (laughs) But in the end, it's all about authenticity. And without vulnerability, there's no authenticity. And um, failing. I mean, it's like first to have something taken by no fault of your own. Well, maybe if I would have just gone to the doctor right away, maybe I wouldn't have had to do five months of chemo. But, I mean, it's pointless to be hashtag. You would have walked. (laughs) <laughs> I did. I, you played that cancer card. Oh, I know. Well, I thought that would work in secondary state, but it did not. <laughs> that was an interesting story. I mean, not you know, but it was just this did weird, you play it? weird. I, well, we 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 did a little. Because I still play. It. Yeah, yeah, we did a little. Um, we, it, but just the the tiny synopsis. That race had the highest turnout that Louisiana had seen in thirty something years. Wow. And so when you're running off race like Secretary of State and you've got like, I think we had 12 people on the ballot yeah. and you're in a low information race because nobody's given a Secretary of State a ton of money to do commercials. Yeah. Nobody really understands everything about you and you got too many people on the ballot. And, I mean, you know, what, for whatever reason it didn't work out. And honestly, now I look at it and some of the things that have happened, especially in that office and with elections and all the hubbub, I'm, I'm glad. I'm kind of glad because yeah. I've watched our Secretary of State have to navigate some pretty tough waters. And um, yeah, you got to have a lot of patience for people right. and stuff like that. And what has happened to you since, like, now what are you doing to make it count? Now, yeah. like, like, I think that's what the important part of Phil says you're doing amazing things. Like, what are those things? Let's let's plug them here. Yeah, yeah. Good. For all of our thousands of listeners that we have. <laughs> good, good. Two millions. So, exactly. <laughs> I know. So, I, I, know. I like that. <laughs> we'll, we're going to put this out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Then sh- she's going to blow us up. That's right. Oh, it's That's really right. Cool. <laughs> so, so what, what was really cool about it is that because I, I traveled to state with the Committee of 100 talking about tax reform back in 2015, and then I traveled to state doing the race for treasurer until I had to get out of it in 2017. 2018, I traveled to state again with Secretary of State, so I met an entire state of people. I mean, my, I, I, you know, when I finished, I had 45,000 email addresses. You know, it was like, it was a very... It, it really, it, it still, even though it didn't work out and it was raw and it was hard, I, I came out of it with a ton of people I knew. Um, another thing that I noticed is that, like, I really liked people on both sides of the aisle. Like, I didn't feel compelled to just stay in my silo. And I really looked at the different sides of the aisle as trying to solve the same problems with a different way. Not the blasted devil and the enemy. We could be friends and hear each other. And the other thing that I noticed in running for those offices is how infrequently people would talk about really constructive policy. It was always this divisive partisan stuff. And it's like, there are actual things that people like research and study and like are data driven that could help make Louisiana not 49th or 50th, mm-hmm. which would yeah. be objectively awesome. Yeah, right? So when I first got out of the legislature, well, I mean, I've got to go back to cancer advocacy because that's really important, but I started Elevate Louisiana because I thought that that would be, and it is, it's, we had 170 women statewide as some of the biggest women leaders in our state to come together to talk cross-partisan and to come up with and learn about solutions to make Louisiana better. Um, and that has been really successful and so much fun. And I'm just so proud of who that group is. Just a little plug, but that's elevatela.org, which is E-L-L-E-V-A-T-E-L-A.org. We can also put in the show notes for you. Perfect. 
Jeffrey. So Linky in the bayou. That's what yeah. Brian has said. <laughs> yeah, he's like smiling. <laughs> he's um, like, I got something to do. <laughs> um, so I started that, and that's been really uh, uh, just an honor to be able to do. Starting in 2018, though, when I was still in the legislature, I started working on cancer legislation. So we passed 3D mammography meaning that the insurance companies had to cover 3D mammography because it's a lot more effective for dense breast tissue, mm -hmm. like we talked about earlier. And it's um, just more effective in general. And if you remember, there was a time when you'd have to, if you want it 3D, you got to pay 50 bucks or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was always like, what do I care if it's 3D? Because I didn't even know what it was back right. then. They would say 3D, and all I could think about was when you get like um, the, the ultrasound of your baby, and I'm like, I don't really need to see its face. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Just it. I didn't understand what it was, so I bypassed it every time. And um, you know, we worked. I worked with Karen Stahl um, to get 3D mammography passed, and then um, also worked on like if you had had bilateral mastectomy, they were like, Hey, we're not going to scan you anymore. You don't get PET scans or anything like that, and it. Somebody had even said because uh, metastatic breast cancer is not curable. And it was like, wait, hold the phones. Mm -hmm. You're telling me that you're not going to scan because if why I bother? Not, right? <laughs> so we passed a law saying that if your doctor orders a PET scan, that the insurance company has to pay for it. Yeah. And so there were a lot of other bills. Like we licensed the, I say the, they were my, I mean, generally my bills, but I licensed genetic counselors. Um, all kinds of stuff. We worked on trying to get additional dollars for cancer research in Louisiana uh, because, you know, we're one of the only, well, not one of the only, but we don't have an NCI designated cancer research center here. You know, one of the highest instances of cancer in the nation. Exactly. Exactly. And there's a lot at play there. We've got a lot of competing hospitals and it's, it's a tough environment for a lot of a lot of reasons right yeah. now but um and then the next year one of the most one of the bills that i'm the most proud of is that i worked with Komen foundation um to do a bill that prohibited step therapy for stage four metastatic patients so like if you can imagine that you're stage four metastatic and they're like well you know we think we need to try the least expensive thing first and then we'll work our way up to what your doctor suggested and it's like oh, no yeah <laughs> So, I, you know, I had Kelly Beckman, um, who's a dear friend, and she lives with stage four metastatic cancer. And we sat at the table in the legislature, and we got that thing passed. And it had a fiscal note. And these were the days when, God forbid, if something cost a dollar, you know, yeah. we got that passed. 2020, um, with Dr. Mark Petrana, we passed um, Precision Medicine. I think now it's amazing to learn I don't think everybody really understands how much ground is being conquered in the quest to cure cancer. Um, now, if you hear a lot of commercials that are for like immunotherapy, mm -hmm. most of those immunotherapies are because they've identified the mutation that's at work in your tumor. Mm -hmm. And no matter where it is in the body, if it's traveled, you know, they can go in with precision medicine using these tools and cure your cancer without chemo. Mm -hmm. But we had to get insurance companies to pay for it because right. it wasn't uniformly being covered. And then the next year we worked on the, the biomarker tests. You have to have DNA, uh, whole genome sequencing biomarker tests to be able to identify if you're eligible mm -hmm. for precision medicine. Um, so it's just really been just something that has brought so much reward to me. Yeah. I feel like it was easy for me, having gone through the cancer, to know how I would repurpose that into good in the world because I was in the legislature and I had to start passing bills. And then when I get out of the legislature, I'm just going to keep going with this. Mm -hmm. This is something that means a lot to me. And we've been able to do things in Louisiana that aren't really happening in red states. Yeah. You know, red states, we tend to be a little bit more conservative with requiring insurance companies to pay for things and with things that are gonna cost the state money. And um, I'm really, it, it, it's meant the world to me to be able to make some changes to actually bring better cancer care to patients. Evelyn, you we talked about uh, dense breast tissue. 
which um, I had a bill with Dr. Ralph Corsetti, who I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, we passed a bill that brought the standards for what insurance had to pay for up to the standards of the American Society of Breast Surgeons. Mm -hmm. And there is caveats in that for if you have dense breast tissue that they have to do additional scans, mm -hmm. not just your standard mammography that just shows a big white mass. Yeah. So you can't see a tumor in it. You can't yeah. see what that's in it. So it's been a lot of legislation. It's been, it's really become part of my life's work, yeah. if not the greater part of my life's work, you know, between that and the Elevate. Um, You're truly I, making it count. Well, hey, you. thank you. I'm so excited because it's like, you take this opportunity to take the tragedy and turn it to triumph to help other people and knit people together in community. I know. You're like my best friend. Y'all too. I was listening to your podcast and I'm like, now wonder Phil invited me. It's amazing. Yeah. It's so amazing because that's exactly like what I talk about all the time. Yeah. And so, so then I'm working on this other concept. I mean, I'm still going to keep doing the advocacy, mm -hmm. not stopping on that at all, not stopping on Elevate, but this other idea, scan. Uh, Survivors Cancer Action Network. I've been meeting with doctors and hospitals and um, not-for-profits that do charity work for, for cancer patients. And I've actually brought your name up a few times, Phil, because I know you you got one going on it, it's here. It's a degree like the temperature. <laughs> yeah. Don't press pronounce his last name. It's <laughs> hard to spell. Like, I have to think about it. And it's a capital G. Yeah. I learned that the hard way, too. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you think about the fact that there's all these people I want to help. You and I, Phil, talked about this at, 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 at lunch, at lunch yeah. one of the first times that we saw each other since high school. Yeah. And you said, I want to help the kids of people that don't win their fight against cancer. Right. And, but how do I find them? That's the whole thing. I'm looking with SCAN, and I've already started, and I've already got the seed money, and I'm already building it out, but to build out a private social network for cancer patients, cancer survivors, caregivers, doctors, hospitals, drug companies. The LCRC, the Cancer Research Center downtown, wants to keep a list of all the clinical trials going on on there. And we're working with another company, um, and we don't quite have it finalized, but it's so exciting to provide navigation services so that you know, like if you go to the hospital and you're, you're dealing with something big like this and there's a nurse navigator yeah, yeah. that helps you like get your records together so that when you go to your oncologist it you know, all works or get your records together, make sure you get all your scans, all that. Well, there's a whole lot of the cancer battle that happens outside of the hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, when you think about a state like Louisiana, where so big of a percentage of the state lies below the poverty line. I had so many connections and so much, I had so much help. Yeah. I had so much help. I turned away help, but it's because people want to help and they don't, they can't connect with They just don't need it. They're like, yeah. we have money for you. And I'm like, I, I don't need your money. I, I love that you're doing this, but I want somebody that's less fortunate than me to have it. Yeah. This is a, met, this is going to be a network where through these navigators and through the communication that goes on, we can connect the people in need to the not-for-profits that are out there to help. And one of the coolest things I'm excited about is to train up, to train up mentors, to match mentors with people that need a mentor yeah. to go through the battle. Um, ultimately, too, working with my friend Lisa McKenzie, who does Unite, and she does this thing called SCARP, and story crafting, where you help figure out, like, what does your scar from your cancer mean? Mm -hmm. And what is the fruit that you want to bring from this season of your life? I think that through doing those programs with the people that we have in our survivor network, that we're actually going to feed back volunteers to these groups. We're going to feed back people to help, mentors. It's just going to be, I think, a cycle where we can help people and help people repurpose their cancer into something greater than the ordeal that they just went through. Yeah. I'm so excited about it. Wow, that's like a mic drop. 
That's awesome. <laughs> you know, but, but what's great is that you don't find a lot of people that are truly passionate about what they do, right? Like you don't. You it's it's very hard to find. So like your energy here is just like I'm like I can go out and be a badass woman too. <laughs> If Julie can do it, I can do it. You're a right Hear me, woman, girl. <laughs> She's my new best friend. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to get the numbers out for you. No, but it's 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 very um, enlightening. And, and like, yeah, I can feel that you're, you are passionate about it. And it's so great because you are going to help so many people. Just oh, better, right? And that you had that. Um, I'll be honest with you. I'm getting vulnerable here a little bit. I hate politics. Like, just completely hate it. But like here, thank you. <laughs> um, but hearing you and like just having a different view of politics, just hearing you talk about different things has kind of opened me up a little bit well, about what you. like maybe I should be invested in that or we suck in Louisiana. No, I'm just kidding. You know, <laughs> but like it's been a it, this has been an eye opening experience for me. So thank you. Thank you for that. And, and I, I hate politics too. I mean, I, I do. I look at it and I, I think I look at it like from a sociological perspective and I watch the news shows and everything and I'm like, oh my gosh, where where's the stream going to crash into? Yeah. You know, because um, we're, we're in a precarious place at the moment. And um, But I do love policy and I love bringing people together and kind of proving to people that we're not, other people are not the enemy. Yeah. The other side is not evil. They just have a different way. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's a struggle because the whole time I'm working in this way, I find the world getting more and more divided. It's hard to watch. Yeah. yeah. So I don't blame any politics too. But, but bringing the, like, this is what's great about, like, y'all are cancer or, like, this these um, life events that happen. It doesn't matter what race you are, what color you are. I worked in cardiac rehab for three years, five years, three years, I don't remember. But like, I would always remember telling the patients, heart disease does not discriminate. They don't care what color you are, cancer doesn't discriminate. It doesn't care what color you are, what age, what race, what gender, like it's coming for you, That's right. right, you know? But like, it's amazing to watch people who are, who have different sides come together on a struggle. So you're going to be able to bring people together. That's going to be amazing to watch. Well, and, and that, that, but you're exactly right that when cancer happens, who cares? Right. Who cares? You know, when when I, I just um, met a, a new friend, and she's got her thing is chip happens. And when chip happens, yeah, you've got to make it work. And I'll date this podcast a little bit, but a good example of that is that today, or it might have been yesterday, because of the catastrophic hurricane that passed over Florida, um, you saw um, Joe Biden and Ron DeSantis on a joint media thing, you know, talking fairly good about each other. <laughs> it's like, so that tragedy brings people together. Unfortunately, they lose it. Yeah. But I mean, I just want to stay in that place. You know, I want to stay in the place of, of just seeing the world improve mm -hmm. one little nugget at a time. Well, just like 9-11, like after 9-11, we were all America. It didn't matter mm -hmm. what, where we were, but then we lost that again, yeah. right? Like, and then, so it's it's having good people like you in the world mm -hmm. at, at at really big places to keep moving forward. And I, I think that what you've opened my eyes to is that that whole, um, you know that guy that was walking down the sea and he would throw the starfish back and somebody said, oh, you, you can't help all the starfish. And he's like, but if I can help this just one, you know, I can throw it back in. And you're, you're that one. You're that one that's going to make a huge difference. I really world. appreciate that. I, I really, I appreciate what you guys are doing because when I listen to your podcast, it's just so tied in with the way I think about loss and suffering and I think it's beautiful what you guys are doing to let people tell their stories of loss and how they're turning it into something good in the world because that makes it it's not worth enough. It. Not enough of that. Yes, yeah. no, no, it's, it's not. not. There's not. Well, the more you talk about it, the more people will be like, "Wait a minute, maybe there's something good that can happen from this crisis, this disaster, this health problem, whatever." Um, I think you're on a good, a really good trajectory with this i'm really excited for so julie if somebody out there right now just got the diagnosis 
and maybe they're torn between make it I go back to making this decision of what's going on in their personal life versus what's happening what advice would you give them um well you know first of all if if you have not been getting your scans mm -hmm. to find out if you're you know if, if you've got a problem and you don't even know it go get them um, you know, no matter what that is, your colonoscopy, nobody likes to do that. But, you know, they do give you good medicine. <laughs> and you wake up and you don't even know what happened. So go get it. And go get your mammography and make sure that if you've got dense tissue that you're, you know, getting the enhanced, you know, scans that you should get. And then if you feel a lump, like me, and don't be a moron, <laughs> go in immediately and then you know finally if you're struggling and you have cancer and you're you don't know how you're going to make ends meet you don't know how you're going to feed your kids you don't even know how you're going to get up off the stupid sofa reach out you know if you've got if you've got somebody out there that you know of already reach out to them if you don't email me julie at stokesflame.com and I'll help connect you to people. Yeah. And then if, if, if you're like, I just want to register for a scan, you know, so that when we get the whole network built, yeah. I can be part of it. Or if I want to read Julie and I just don't know what the heck she just said, that was to explain. But if you didn't, like, just don't know what she said, go to scan-la.org and you'll find a place where you can sign up for the private social network once it's all built out. Awesome. And we'll put all this in the show notes for awesome. you. Julie, thank you so much for coming to stop by. I would love to follow up with you thank and you. see how things are going and just how you're keeping on making it count and paying it forward. Yeah. Told you this was going to be a good one. Well, I, you can't believe everything, folks. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Great soul. <laughs> all right, guys, it's time to go out and make it count.